Hi, my name is Anna Disser. I'm a student at Azusa, at Azusa Pacific University, and today I will be discussing a reckoning of our current understanding of abortion rhetoric and policies and reimagining of how the Christian church can better handle these dialogues. So before I begin, I wanted to make a quick note about the language that I will be using. As Rebecca Todd Peters suggests in her book, Trust Women, a Progressive Christian Argument for Reproductive Justice, I will be using the term neonate rather than a sensationalized term like unborn baby or cold clinical terms like fetus or embryo. So you can see up on the screen some of my guiding research questions, uh, but really the heart of what I explored through my research addresses the assumption that the Christian church is universally against abortion and universally for abortion bans. So from there, I asked the question of whether this debate on the morality of abortion is really that black and white, and if abortion bans are actually the most effective way to decrease abortions. So I don't have time to go into the full history of abortion law, but I still wanted to give a brief overview of Roe v. Wade and the theory behind that ruling because it establishes a lens through which we understand these policies. So Roe sets the standard for what laws states can and cannot make regarding abortion. And as this quote says, Roe considered abortion a fundamental right, but it hinges upon this question of what a compelling state interest is. We can reframe this question to ask, when is the state primarily interested in the health and well-being of the pregnant person, and when are they primarily interested in the health and well-being of the neonate? So states have answered that question differently, hence the fact that different states have different laws regarding when in the pregnancy abortion is allowed. But Roe actually answered that question uh, within the original ruling with the trimester framework that Justice Blackman laid out. So to briefly summarize this framework, states would only be allowed to make laws establishing basic safety standards uh, for abortions in the first trimester, uh, more regulations to protect the pregnant person's health, um, from the second trimester to the point of viability, but it isn't until the point of viability, which is when the neonate can survive outside outside the uterus, which is about 24 to 28 weeks, it's only then that the state would be allowed to ban abortion because they now have a vested interest in the neonate. But if you've been following the news, many states are banning it much earlier. So the final piece of background information that I wanted to give is the facts on who actually gets abortions. Uh, so first, the vast majority of abortions occur in the first trimester, so these are not babies being ripped out of their mother's wombs at nine months pregnant. Second, over half of people who have already had at least one live birth, um, uh, so most of these people are um, getting abortions uh, who have already had at least one life birth. So a lot of these people are already parents. Um, third, over half of people who uh, have abortions are in their 20s. So it's not just teens getting pregnant. And uh, finally, 42% of people who have abortions are Black, which when you consider the Black Americans make up 13% of the population is a pretty significant number. A little bit later, we'll also look into the inequities that contribute to why people get abortions and how many of these inequities are tied to racism. So going on to the secular research that I did, um, in doing this research on abortion policy and why people get abortions, I came away with these four takeaways. So we'll get into these as I review that research, but the broad summary of this is abortion is that abortion is a nuanced issue with several systemic issues that feed into it and effectively reducing abortions requires a more nuanced approach than just restricting it. So in this presentation, I will be looking at two of those research studies. So the first research study uh, looked at abortion law in Ohio from 2010 to 2018 and the rates of abortion during that time period. So during that period, several laws were passed that restricted access to abortion. This study actually found that legal abortion restrictions have questionable effectiveness. And the reason for this is because during that time period, abortion in Ohio didn't decrease any more significantly than it did nationally. In fact, the study found that abortions just got pushed later into the pregnancy. So this chart up on the screen uh, shows how many abortions occurred at different points in the pregnancy. Uh, so we have Ohio on the left um, and the entire United States on the right. 
And so the sections um, of the graph towards the top of the chart show abortions later in the pregnancy. And so if you're looking at it, you can see that these later abortions actually increased in Ohio during this time period, whereas in the United States, they stay relatively the same. So the theory is um, that these policies are restricting access to abortion um, and it doesn't stop abortion. It just, these policies just make it take longer to get one. And so abortions ended up occurring later in the pregnancy than they would have without the restrictions. And that's less safe. So in the second study, researchers interviewed people who got abortions and discussed why they came to that decision, which gives us very holistic look at factors contributing to that decision. Listed here are the categories under which most of the answers fall, fell under, with the most common one being finances. And what this shows is both that there's not one reason that people get abortions, and that there is an overwhelming connection between many of the participants' responses to a lack of resources. So here we see two different participants' answers, one who's saying that they don't have maternity leave and couldn't afford to take time off of work, and one who is saying they don't have health insurance. And so these answers are different, but both of these issues could be resolved by comprehensive social programs that improve access to health care and mandate the provision of maternity leave. And the same was true for many of the other participants who answered, which reveals that the system makes it difficult for people who want to have children to actually have them. So now as we shift into the Christian research, we'll unpack some of the work of three Christian scholars. With the first two, we're going to explore the personhood of the neonate, or rather we as Christians should see neonates as having identical value to born people. So first, let's look at John Golden Gay and his commentary on Psalm 139. Uh, this is the verse that says, you knit me together in my mother's womb and is frequently used in anti-abortion stances. Golden Gay comments on how this psalm expresses the wonder that Yahweh or God has in the process of creation and how intimately Yahweh knows each individual person. And while the psalms are not laws and they're not used to establish moral standards, Golden Gate does point out how this wonder that Yahweh has with the process of human development um, means that it would have to be a serious decision to have an abortion and disrupt that creation process. And so while Golden Gay looks at the neonate more as a being with full personhood, Margaret Kimisuka looks at it a little differently. Her understanding of the neonate's value can essentially be summed up to say that the neonate has value because they are a living being with the potential to become a born person, but this value is not identical uh, to the value of an already born person. And that might be something that's really jarring to hear, but it's also important to when we remember that we must consider the value of the born person who is carrying the neonate in addition to the value of the neonate. So finally, Rebecca Todd Peters looks at the question of pregnancy as a moral choice. What she's really pointing out here is that we often debate the morality of abortion, but we don't usually think to ask if pregnancy is always a moral good, even when it's an unwanted pregnancy. She points out that pregnancy is not an isolated incident, and the way that a child is raised and the environment where they are raised will impact them for the rest of their life. And this is not to say that there are certain environments in which a child should never be raised or people who shouldn't have children, but this question does challenge us to consider how someone who wants to have an abortion because they don't want a child to be placed into a broken foster care system is justified in their reasoning. So the question is, how do we reconcile all of this research? Christian scholars don't all agree on whether abortion is always a bad moral choice, but what it does agree on is that people and beings who have the potential to become people have value. And secular research shows that this issue isn't really about whether we believe abortion is a bad moral choice or not. Because at the end of the day, systemic inequities are the root cause of so many abortions, and those are the things that we need to do something about. My secular research showed that this is a healthcare inequity issue. It is linked to classism and especially racism because Black Americans have disproportionately high rates of poverty and disproportionately high rates of abortion. Abortion is linked to sexism in the workplace. And the thing that every American, especially Christians and especially 
especially those that consider themselves pro-life, needs to keep in mind is that our system is currently set up in a way that makes it impossible for people to choose life. If we are truly seeking Christian flourishing for all parties involved in this issue, then we need to address inequity first. If we want to reduce abortion, we need to start by dismantling white supremacy and advocating for comprehensive social programs. It is only after we do those things that we make it possible for everyone to choose life. Greetings from my home office in Upland, California. I'm excited for us to get together and talk about some of these issues about politics and social construction and, and race and other social justice issues. And as they relate to our faith and our disciplines in the liberal arts, uh, it's exciting to be able to do that. And I'm of course grateful to Lily and for their support over the years for this kind of endeavor and um, their ability to allow us to engage as thinkers uh, in this kind of endeavor, and hopefully to come up with some ways in which we can make uh, our culture and context a little bit better. Um, I have to start, though, with a, um, a confession. In November 2020, I decided that I was through with Facebook. I quit it, got off. Um, I'd heard all I could hear about masks and vaccinations and social justice issues, and of course, the 2020 election, and all of the the somewhat illogical to totally absurd arguments that were being made, and nobody was willing to engage in a conversation about where that came from, even if asked from a heart of truly wanting to understand. 2020 made people angry, it made people on edge, it gave people a chance to vent, and social media was the perfect place to do that, and I knew for my mental health, I need to just get off. So I exited Facebook. Haven't gone back yet, but I'm still considering it. Because the rhetoric I saw was so harsh, responses were unthinking, illogical, and a call for constructive dialogue was usually met with some sort of anger or hostility. So that all led me, as a Christian who studies rhetoric and as a political operative and campaign speechwriter uh, on the side for my academic career, how did those all fit together? And why was I seeing something so different in 2020, um, but that it, that it didn't surprise me, but I wanted to know why? And I think that's the conversion of these areas of my life that this presentation allows me to dive into just a little bit and to be able to figure out what, uh, what really is going on as we look at each of these areas. So this is a, a precursor to much further research, I hope, uh, in, this, in this area. The, um, this, the second part of, of how I want to introduce this really has to do with the, the role the liberal arts has played uh, from my own college on to today. Uh, it has provided me a moral compass uh, because I discovered a lot of my own faith, biblically based faith, uh, my disciplinary compass of, of rhetoric and guys like Aristotle, who's looking over my shoulder uh, right now, and being a campaign consultant and writing into the context of what was going on in 2020. When we move beyond 2020 in terms of political dialogue, I hope we can use the Liberal Arts Foundation to help us answer the questions about how our understandings of advocacy, in my case, rhetoric, can better inform discussion and dialogue that's more civic and more civil in the future. And that's what I want to attempt to do. So, and the nice thing is I do have hope. I have hope that these kinds of things will, will self-correct in some ways, but we have to set the context a little bit because philosophy comes into this or worldview in terms of saying, what made the context of 2020 so rife for these kinds of conflicts. And part of that has to do with the fact that we sat at the apex of the influence of postmodern thought that came out of the 80s and into the 2000s and entered our thinking and our acting when applied. And just a reminder that there are really five basic principles that, that people have, who have written about postmodernism, like Arthur Holmes and Walsh and Middleton and uh, Jim Sire and others, as well as the postmodern writers themselves, people like Francois Lyotard and Jacques Derrida, you can elicit these five principles from. First of all, there is no meta narrative. There is no big picture to help us discover truth. So we don't have anything to bounce things off. Related secondly to the fact that truth is relative, so it's your interpretation, which is related to the third principle, which is it's really about self-interpretation and the development of self-identity. Fourth, it's about understanding that experience is more important than logic in most cases. And finally, fifth, that, that Conclusions can be irrational, 
illogical and even counterfactual. So philosophy steps in and gives us a little bit of a lesson, so the liberal arts to the rescue, one more time. So what is rhetoric when you get into this area? What does it offer us in terms of looking at the political dynamic? James Martin wrote a book in 2014 called Politics and, and Rhetoric. And in, the, in it he says, by why, but why use rhetoric to examine what politicians do rather than, for example, language, ideology, or discourse, all of which are good? What is it that rhetoric offers that these more familiar categories don't? A preliminary answer is that rhetoric permits an understanding of persuasive speech communication as a situated practice in argumentation. To explore rhetoric is to consider how, at a specific moment and place, ideas are fashioned into arguments with certain force and direction in order to win the assent of an audience. Anecdotally, um, I was at a conference, a conservative um, political action conference uh, in Colorado uh, a few years, well, 2015, so it was before the 2016 election, uh, and Donald Trump was one of the invited guests. I took my third son at the time, um, who was about 14, um, to the event, and uh, when uh, former President Trump walked on stage, then candidate Trump, um, he Unlike speech writing that I was aware of, he, he went into a series of sentences that ended with platitudes. And in that, he uh, would say things like, build a wall. And we would watch the crowd kind of go crazy. Like, ah, you know, the crowd would go wild. And my son asked me after the speech, he said, what did he actually say? And I'm like, I'm, I'm so glad you're in a classical educational environment because that's your answer asking the right questions. You know, what was actually said and why did the audience respond the way it did? It's because there's a mastery of the rhetorical moment. And that went on to inform a lot of what's happened in 2020 as well. As a professional, it was not surprising to see the degeneration of the uh, rhetoric around the uh, campaigns. Everything from 2016 when we saw, you know, name calling on the debate stage to 30 second ads that had no factual basis at all. And this is from all sides of the aisle, um, throughout state, local, regional, national races. So professionally, it's not surprising, but it also is, is, is an era where political rhetoric is formulated by the media in a way that's easily digestible by people. And because of that, people don't have a chance to critically think about it. So one of the things that we don't understand is we don't understand our own context, but we don't understand what we're hearing and how to ask the right questions. Again, I believe the liberal arts come to the, come to the fore at this point, where we can get critical thinkers who can ask the right questions. So also, what does it mean then to be Christian in the 2020 election and beyond? Uh, the divide grew. Um, we saw that evident, you know, evidenced across, especially in the era we would call the evangelical Christian movement. Uh, it became even more intertwined with politics uh, and created an even greater divide, which we're seeing uh, written about uh, now in terms of what's happening in the church and the Christian community. From the discipline of communication, the world looked at the specific messaging being published and shared and not the manner in which it was said, which is an important part of it. Jesus provides an example of how the truth mattered, but more importantly, what you said mattered about the truth. In John chapter 8, when he talks about the woman caught in adultery, he he doesn't, when he talks to the woman finally, he, he elicits and stops the violence that's about to happen in terms of rock throwing uh, against this woman. And you, but he doesn't, when he gets to the end, he said, you know what you did was wrong, go and sin no more. He gives us a manner in which we are supposed to engage in the conversation. And I think we in the Christian community generally, and again, overgeneralize, have forgotten a little bit about that. So where's the hope? Well, the hope is in a commitment to the goals of liberal arts education um, to have educated, informed citizens. We need them. I think people understand more and more why that's needed. There's hope in the natural reining in, particularly of divisive language and rhetoric. We have lots of examples in history and political history, if we go back to it. And hope in Christians being willing to enter the public square and to engage in and facilitate the more civil dialogue that needs to occur. There's, there's hope in the courage of educated citizens changing the ways in which people, other people speak and what those limits should be. 
And there's a lot of research in the future to uncover how these issues merge together and seek a better system. Well, today I've, I've been only briefly able to uncover some of these complex issues that need a lot more time than 10 minutes. So I beg forgiveness for any oversights or even some misstatements or overgeneralization. It's a journey of discovery and we've merely scratched the surface. But here's hoping that the conversations I have with my four sons and my then 90 year old mother will be very different in 2022. And that if I choose to return to Facebook, I'll be better equipped to help facilitate a Christ honoring dialogue and advocacy that our citizens and my friends deserve. Okay, so uh, for my talk today, um, it's entitled, Why Do I Go to Extremes? Using Political Beliefs to Signal to uh, In-Group Members. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is how um, there may be certain kinds uh, of uh, evidence from, from both the uh, cognitive science of religion, as well as uh, uh, social psychology in general that may help to explain why certain persons uh, go to extremes in terms of their, pol of their uh, particular uh, um, uh, political beliefs. And that there may be certain kind of strategic reasons why persons sometimes adapt some of these beliefs as a way to um, further some of their own um, uh, social goals. So I'm going to start off uh, with an example of this. Um, and so I'm going to start off with the example of uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And uh, she is a U.S. I'm a congressperson and a, a Republican from, from uh, Florida. And so what's interesting in her case is um, she's actually advocated for several conspiracy theories. Um, she She's advocated that I'm a 9-11 and uh, the planes flying into the World Trade Center may have been a hoax. Uh, she's argued that um, former President Obama may actually be a, a secret Muslim, and that the Clintons um, may have um, murdered some of their own um, a political rivals. And so what's interesting is she's taken on several views, or I'm sorry, several um, extreme views, several conspiracy views, um, and because of that, um, she's been really um, I'm a critiqued for a lot of these views. And because of that, actually, she was removed from um, several of the uh, committees that she was a part of in, in, in a Congress. But the interesting thing is, despite the fact that she was removed from all of these um, committees, she still was able to raise $3.2 million of uh, political contributions. Uh, just in the year of um, 2021 alone. So despite the fact that she's taken on these fairly extreme sorts of beliefs, it seems to be in some ways kind of playing in her favor, meaning that it's helping her own political career and especially helping out in terms of uh, donations. So this kind of raises several different questions. Why is someone who would advocate views that have been so thoroughly debunked in terms of, um, of the possibility of them actually being true, um, why is she still so successful in a politics? And then what kinds of processes might be at work that enable a person who is considered to be unfit for office from one side of the aisle, and instead she's actually praised on the other side of the aisle? And so what I'm going to try to argue is that psychology and the study of religion may offer certain cues as to what is actually going on. So I'm gonna offer um, um, a couple of different possibilities about why this might be the case by looking at the study of religion and the study of uh, psychology. So I'm gonna start off by talking about credibility enhancing uh, displays or uh, creds. And um, what's been found by, by, by a Henrik back in 2009 is that different social learning strategies are going to be very important to, to, to uh, cultural transmission. But there's a problem that we can run into in terms of social learning, and that would be false advertising, meaning how do you know who to trust when you're learning different kinds of information? And so one of the things that may have evolved as a way to help with this problem of false advertising are creds, especially, especially uh, 
um, uh, religious creds. So religious behaviors and rituals may serve a function in terms of creds, meaning they may enhance the credibility of what it is you're saying by adhering to certain kinds of religious values, um, behaviors, and uh, rituals. And so there's a few different lines of evidence that actually seem to show that this is the case. Um, uh, children are much more likely to adopt the religious beliefs of their parents when they demonstrate creds. Um, when persons heard the Islamic uh, the, the uh, Islamic call to prayer, it actually increased honesty rates on a math test. And then priming with uh, religious words increased offers during an uh, economic game. So it seemed to be the case that these kinds of signals or uh, displays may have a certain role um, in terms of their social functioning. Now, when we look a little bit closer at these, it's not only just um, creds, but also how costly are these signals. Uh, so one of the variables that is often involved in creds or religious signals is how costly they are. Meaning, and the more costly they are, the more potential they are to actually signal higher levels of, uh, of uh, commitment. And there's actually several, uh, there's several, uh, there's several areas of research that also demonstrate this. So uh, religious communes are much more likely to survive when they have more, more uh, costly requirements. Persons are much more likely to give donations after viewing an act of group, of group, uh, um, a commitment. And in the island nation of of uh, Martrice. After witnessing an extreme set of uh, devotional rituals, persons actually donated much larger amounts of money to a local temple. So it seems to be the case that there's two things going on. We have displays uh, that are used to kind of show some kind of commitment to a group and that you're trustworthy. And then we also have this other variable of just how costly they are and that at times the more costly the behavior or the ritual, the more levels of commitment that they're actually that they're actually trying to, to, to uh, signal. So when we move this into the world of, of uh, political beliefs, we can see that some kinds of beliefs are somewhat strategic, meaning that we're using them or adapting them for certain kinds of reason, uh, of certain kinds of reasons because they help our own social goals. And this is where beliefs can have a certain kinds of signaling function, meaning that, the, that when I believe X, it's trying to signal to a certain group that I'm committed to them, um, and that I'm there, and that I'm, a, and that I'm a part of their own um, in group. So it's often assumed that persons form their beliefs by simply weighing the evidence. As if they do their own a particular investigation, they think through it, and then based on that, they they actually adopt a certain belief. However, beliefs can be used as more of a signal, and they can show an allegiance to a certain group. And then, of course, political beliefs often take on this kind of function. So your beliefs about a particular issue are often used to actually put you into a, 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 a particular group. So how you feel about abortion, gay rights, or even something like um, the climate change typically says that you are either on one side of the political, um, of the, of the, uh, political spectrum or on the other side of, of the uh, political spectrum. So why do these beliefs become more extreme? And so one of the reasons that these beliefs might become more extreme is that it makes a much more distinct, um, a much more distinct sort of signal. So the more extreme belief, the more you can signal to your in-group that you are a part of that group and you are separate from the uh, out-group. So this clearly draws a line, a very distinct line between different types of groups. And it makes the differences between those groups much more pronounced, and it's much more easier to uh, distinguish us from them. So it's an easy way to see, to see and to identify that you are part of this in-group and not a part of this, of this other out-group. And the more extreme the belief, the more it might play a larger role in making sure that distinction is clear. So the more extreme that your belief is, the higher the signal of of a commitment that you're making to your uh, particular group. So for example, um, let's say that the uh, scientific um, community puts out a statement about, about um, a climate change. 
and says that something like, I'm a climate change is real. Now, if you go along with that statement, typically it won't make too much of a wave. I mean, it won't make too much of a difference because kind of everybody already agrees with that, or at least this particular, uh, this particular um, community already agrees with that. But if you uh, go against the statement, it actually leads to more coverage from the media because it's like the stronger you're going against something that's so established by one group of persons, it actually seems to kind of increase this kind of signal or kind of increases how against you are some other kind of group. And then if you've already labeled that particular group as a group of liberals um, who are different from you as a conservative, you're showing more group loyalty to your particular in-group and more and you're standing up or or you're standing against people who people who you would consider to be in your out group. And those so this once again shows your own loyalty to your group. And the more extreme that particular view is, it simply kind of increases your own clout within that group or your own standing in that group. And so I think this is part of what's happening in these kinds of situations is that a more extreme group, uh, see, I'm sorry, a more extreme, um, a more extreme uh, belief creates a stronger signal and allows there to be a, a more easily made um, a distinction um, between your particular in-group and another out-group. Um, so that's it for my time uh, uh, for today. Thanks for listening, and I'll take any questions that you have. Yeah, we had a, a great, great uh, presentations. Uh, uh, they, are wonderful, they were wonderful presentations. And now we take some time uh, for uh, Q&A. We have about uh, 20 minutes uh, you know, to go. And I have some questions for each of our presenters, but I would like to give a, a chance for one of the participants who posted a question. So. I, I think the question is um, not particularly addressed to uh, either one of you specifically, but I, I'm just assuming that any one of you can jump in and kind of make a, your own suggestions. Let me read uh, the question as it is stated. So we have another question as well, but let me start with this one. In dealing with such nuanced and complex issues, how would you suggest engaging in conversation with those who do not have the privilege of a robust liberal arts education. Um, assuming that, uh, uh, Chris, you can jump in and, you know, that I'm, I'm assuming that probably uh, the, the person who posted this question had you in mind, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so we start with you and then uh, the rest of you can really make your own suggestions. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's a great question, but I also think that you have an amazing panel of and for in terms of ages uh, that you could get some different responses because uh, those of us who grew up in sort of my era would say that you know conversation and advocacy is more about sort of winning the argument than it is sort of discovery uh, in the conversation. Um, and let me acknowledge one thing in the statement. Um, having a robust uh, liberal arts education is a privileged position, um, and to take it to take it seriously, I think we have to be able to not not necessarily overwhelm with because it's not that that thinking is not being done by people who don't have that education. It's really just that we've been given a voice and a way to articulate those things. So I would say one of the most powerful things in conversation. Um, can be clarification, which comes through questions. Um, if I can get more, you know, tell me what you're, you're thinking about that and then not fill in the blanks um, for them. Uh, allow, allow the expression of where those thoughts are coming from. Um, and then to be able to say, you know, if, very clearly, I mean, if, if you're, I, I think I hear you saying this, uh, let me make sure I'm on the right page. Uh, and and to push it sort of to the next level, but I think that there's a power in questions. Yep. Yeah, anyone, if you can uh, make any suggestions, if you have anything to say. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to say, um, 
you have to start off with kind of respecting their beliefs and respecting and kind of acknowledging their worth as a person, I think too, and just kind of having a person to person kind of conversation that is respectful and engaging um, and, and not using um, you, your own education at, um, as a source of power and as a way to kind of overcome. I mean, having someone believe what you say is very different than, than, than actually winning a uh, argument. You might be able to, to uh, win the argument, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna suddenly believe in what you say. They might just say you're a complete jerk and never talk to you again. Um, so finding ways to engage their own mind in a way that they can think about those issues in a new way and maybe move them towards change is a much more logical sort of goal because you're not going to win an argument and then go, oh, wow, you're right. I was wrong. I can't believe, you know, no one ever does that. Um, but just giving them options, um, showing them a new perspective, I think that's the best that you could do usually. James, can I ask you just so that you would elaborate on what you said? Uh, sometimes, yeah, you, uh, you, as you correctly pointed out, it's very difficult in this day and age, people kind of admitting, yes, I made a mistake and I'm going to kind of uh, forego my position. And so thank you for showing me my mistake and so on. That's very rare, but it should happen and it could happen. But um, I don't, don't you think we encourage a culture of, uh, you know, sort of uh, dogmatism, you know, intellectual virtues require us, if someone really shows me my mistakes, if my view is really, you know, tinted with all sorts of problems, if I'm intellectually honest person, I, I would profoundly should, you know, thank you and, and, and completely drop my view based on the reasons you presented. I have to either modify my view or drop it all together and work from the scratch and new theory and new view and so on. Otherwise, I, I think it's going to be very troublesome because logically it's impossible for us to embrace everyone's view and put it on equal footing and say, yeah, I am right, you're right, and blah, blah, blah. This is uh, kind of what the postmoderns uh, would suggest. And I think it's pre pretty much uh, self-refuting. I mean, I, I don't think we can, we can co you know, make all sorts of views coexist. Uh, uh, we need to have some sort of a middle ground. So what do you think? How can we really solve this problem? How can we encourage people? It's not a sign of being defeated when you, when you admit your mistake and you know, revise your position. It's just a sign of your intellectual humility. So, well, so few people do that. I mean, even, even other academics. I mean, I've seen many academics have, have kind of several discussions and even when their view is so obviously off, they will not give it up. And I don't know, it's just, it seems like we're human first. I mean, it is true that if you are intellectually humble, you should be open and even want to be corrected. But do people do that? No, I mean, and a lot of it's because once you're kind of on stage and you're talking about your beliefs, when those beliefs are challenged, it's not just your beliefs that are being challenged, it's you that's being challenged. And so people are responding out of their own kind of insecurities, their own, you know, there's so many different psychological factors that are happening underneath. Um, but I still think the, the way most people change their beliefs um, is through kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation when there is openness and the ability to kind of change your mind. I think that happens more often than not. Maybe there's some academic debates that can happen between friends, that that can happen. Um, but even then, I, well, I mean, I have some friends who I can have a good conversation with and I can say that I was wrong and they can say that they're wrong, but that happens within the friendship and it happens with certain kinds of people. Um, I don't know, I don't know how normal that is. I don't know, I mean, I, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but I just haven't seen that happen very much. <laughs> well, uh I think the other like very significant thing here, um, and you touched on it a little bit um, about how beliefs are personal. And a lot of times it, when we're talking about political beliefs, I think sometimes what can be forgotten is that we're not just, oftentimes we're not just talking about political beliefs. We're talking about a belief that is political, but for someone it's also connected to their morals and to their religion. And it's deeply, in many ways, it's deeply connected to their identity. And so, um, you know, I 
think that can be kind of one like frame for understanding why arguments don't work because it can feel deeply personal for someone to have that belief um you know very challenged because it feels like a challenge to themselves and so um you know i i think that yeah is why it's so important to come at it from a place of understand like attempting to understand them um and attempting to understand where they're coming from and that belief um and you know not assume that it's some very disconnected intellectual thing that they have studied and is not at all um you know entwined with their being um and so i think a lot of times it's ongoing conversations it's not just one conversation with another intellectual where you recognize the superiority of something it's something that comes through time and through um conversation um and through that like ongoing change just like the way that we change and develop and grow as human beings yeah beliefs come in packages we usually don't just accept one thing we're accepting all kinds of different stuff and then how far those beliefs go down into our identity and too there's 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 certain social consequences for taking on certain beliefs either against your family or against your social group or against your friends and most people would prefer to be in relationships with their friends than to have a belief that they're not even really sure that they believe or not or don't even know if this academic you know kind of talk them out of it or whatever That's i think and there's a there's a guy named saul kripke who in the philosophy era talked about i think almost prophetically last year because his his philosophy which is a little more mathematically based um comes up with a premise that says what happens when people are presented with things they know are factually untrue and yet they make a decision to go ahead and believe it nonetheless and that was so dominant in 2020 um and more so than other times i think um but to say why was it that people weren't able to sort of break through that uh, and I think part of it has to do with what you just said in terms of the context in which that conversation occurs uh, and the ability for us, again, social media is the worst place um, for us to have any sort of depth to a conversation. Doesn't mean it's absent, but it's really hard. Um, and to make any sort of, of, of relational uh, connection, um, I think we're all excited to get to a point where sitting over sitting with someone over a cup of coffee means something where those conversations you know can occur um, but it's a challenge and i think that's the the challenge we uh as people of faith and people in in education um have to truly take a responsibility for uh, as we as we move into 21 and beyond excellent suggestions there's one question addressed to james uh, so i'll be reading it and uh here is what it says. How do we respond to the extremism? What's the balance between responding versus giving it air? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> like that's that's kind of like the million dollar question. Um, I I think politically, at least in the in terms of Green, um, I would have not have removed her from that committee. I think that it. I think it made things worse rather than better. I think it it just kind of it justified certain kinds of narratives and it actually kind of made things worse. I think that kind of stuff gives them oxygen or gives those kind of beliefs oxygen and the more kind of conflict there is, the more it does to kind of makes things worse. Um but I don't know exactly how to I don't know exactly what to do with it though either because you have to kind of report some of these things. Um, you know, you have to say something about them, but the reporting, you know, when it's done by a liberal media or mainstream media, like it just kind of can make things worse. And I, I, I don't know. Um, I think you, it's almost like the child that you have to ignore because they're kind of getting so much attention from those things. Um, but I think that there's also a lot of other stuff that we'll have to figure out how to do about it too. Do you think, uh, James, um, there's a willful ignorance, for example, when people really hold either extremes and they really know sometimes the truth is obvious, like you don't have to be lectured about which position is true or which issue is just, you know, the, you know we should embrace, but people uh, willfully kind of ignore 
uh, for the reasons that you pointed out earlier. I think, um, do you think people are gambling with their personal ethics? With, by, by that I mean with literally personal <laughs> integrity and the status of truth. They are willfully saying all of these things can go wherever they want to go and I don't care. All I need is you know, the, the product or the outcome. So the means is yeah. not taken into account. It could be any kind of means. So my focus is on the product, on the outcome. So it's a bit consequentialist in this orientation. And um, it's very, very troubling, troublesome. It's, it's, like, it's not really a kind of ignorance that, uh, that is based on lack of knowledge or lack of information. And, and uh, but, you know, in some situations, the people who are embracing the, the, the extreme views are people who really, really know uh, the facts. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. do, do you think this shows that, honestly, human nature is so complicated and uh, kind of, you just can't really say truth doesn't really matter. I, mean, you know, I don't know what, what, uh, what you can say, the virtues do not matter, you know, that's it. So I, I should leave at present and get what I want. <laughs> well, I don't, to me, it's really interesting. I think, I think a really interesting question is how much we can convince ourselves that something is true, even when it's not. I think that we find ways to make, to justify ourselves and to make something true, even when it's not. We ignore certain kinds of evidence and we just kind of say, well, maybe it could be. And we find ways to kind of convince ourselves of things that are untrue. And it is to kind of reach these kind of other goals, these kind of things that we want, either it's power or status or whatever it might be. Um, I think the virtues are probably more important now than ever. Um, the problem is getting people to actually engage them. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's very difficult. And two, as humans, we are good at um, changing our beliefs when it suits us and convincing ourselves that we're doing the right thing, or even that okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of fibbing a little bit here, but there's some kind of greater good down the road. I think we're really good at kind of um, just kind of finding ourselves into that and kind of self and kind of um, um, self-justifying uh, self it as well. 